Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Student Led Journal Club. Um, my name is Anne Marie Parker. I'm a research associate for the Joplin campus of KCU. And today I'll be introducing student Dr. Suniti Dash, who's an anatomy fellow. Uh, student Dr. Suniti Dash is a Joplin anatomy fellow from Macomb, Michigan. During undergrad, she majored in biomedical sciences and anthropology. She volunteered at a crisis line for survivors of sexual aggression all throughout undergrad. And her senior capstone project was focused on providing domestic violence awareness training to pre-medical students. Student Dr. Dash is currently interested in pursuing a career in emergency medicine. And in her free time, she enjoys cooking meals to enjoy with her friends and reading the latest murder mystery book. Um, so with that, I will hand the floor over to you, Student Dr. Dash. Thanks, Anne-Marie. I um, appreciate you getting this scheduled um, and the opportunity to present my research project. And to everyone that um, came out today, um, I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to sharing what I um, researched over the year. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. My research project was a cadaveric study of intercostal neurovascular bundle variation in intercostal spaces. And so here I have my abstract. Um, this is what I submitted I, when I presented at the KCU Research Symposium. And then um, I was able to present my project at the AAA conference uh, this past April. So I'm gonna dive a little bit into the research background of why I picked this project and why I thought it was relevant um, to study the anatomical variations. So with a chest tube thoracostomy, you're creating a surgical opening in the thoracic wall to evacuate air um, secondary to a pneumothorax or pleural fluid, uh, fluid secondary to a pleural effusion. The first time someone ever um, uh, carried out this procedure um, was World War II. And so that wasn't until then when it became a more common procedure. And so now currently, oftentimes, you're going to see this occur in the emergency room and thoracic trauma is commonly treated with a tube thoracostomy. It is one of the most common procedures that are, is carried out in thoracic surgery. And the complication rate associated with this procedure is at 30% currently. And so the goal with this research was to hopefully decrease um, that complication rate further by understanding what the variations in anatomy are. And so the two times that a physician will deny putting in a chest tube in a patient is if the lung is completely adherent to the chest wall or if the patient refuses. And you can see in this image here, um, in sitting in between the superior rib and inferior rib, you have the intercostal neurovascular bundle, and that's what my focus was on. So in this image off to the right, the arrow number three that's pointing off to the side is showing you a severed intercostal nerve. Arrow number two is showing you what a intact intercostal nerve looks like. And so you can see at the side of the chest tube, this is where um, that intercostal nerve was severed. And so some of the complications that can occur when you put in a chest tube is esophageal injury, gastric injury, bowel injury. Um, you can also damage the liver, the spleen, the lung, even the heart. And some of the more common ones are uh, that can cause death uh, is an intercostal arterial hemorrhage. You can have an AV fistula form, a chylothorax, and fibrothorax. And so when physicians are taught to uh, insert chest tubes universally, they use the triangle of safety. And so what is the triangle of safety? So inferiorly, you have the fifth intercostal space. Anteriorly, you have the lateral edge of the pectoralis major. And superiorly, you have the base of the axilla. Laterally, you have the lateral edge of the latissimus dorsi. And so when I um, carried out my research project, I was able to use all the landmarks except for one. And we'll talk about the reason why um, when I go through my material and methods.
In 2005, Dr. Wright and his team at Oxford carried out a study on intercostal neurovascular bundle variation within the fourth through sixth intercostal spaces. And so when I was searching literature, there were not many studies that focused um, on studying the cadaveric um, variation of the intercostal neurovascular bundle, but this was one of them. They utilized 38 cadavers. And what they found after dissecting those 38 cadavers, that the intercostal neurovascular bundle ran lower than the subcostal groove. And that's important because if it's running below the subcostal groove, you can damage it when you're inserting your chest tube. And so they used a total of 228 um, intercostal spaces to collect data. And they found that the most common permutation of those structures or order was van, vein artery nerve. And so on this image off to the right, you can, or the right, you can see the superior rib is here and you have the inferior rib down here, but the vein artery nerve all run lower than that costal groove. And they stated that the safe zone was 50 to 70% of the way down in the intercostal space. And the reason why that's important is because you have the collateral artery running just superior to that inferior rib. Oftentimes when physicians are taught to insert chest tubes, they're told to hug the superior border of that inferior rib. However, if you do that, you may run the risk of damaging that collateral artery as well. And so our research hypothesis was if chest tubes are placed superior to the inferior rib in order to avoid damaging the neurovascular bundle, then identifying the distance of the neurovascular bundle with reference to the corresponding rib can decrease the risk of injury. So now we'll talk a little bit about the methods and materials and how we kind of built our research project off of that. So our goal um, carrying out this research project was three pronged, locate that intercostal neurovascular bundle and measure the distance of the structures within the intercostal space. And so the bundle is typically located in between that inner, internal intercostal muscle and innermost intercostal muscle. Our second goal was to examine the sizes of the intercostal spaces formed by the ribs. So is the fifth intercostal space um, the location where you'll have the largest margin of error or is it the fifth or uh, fourth or sixth? And then the final goal was to note variations of the intercostal neurovascular bundle. So does van hold as the most common variation or is it replaced by a different type of variation? So when we collected our data, we had 51 formalin embalmed cadavers at our disposal to use. However, we ended up only utilizing 35 for data collection. And so we had 12 females and 23 males. And the average age of our cadavers uh, was 77.31 years old. And so we had 306 data points that were possible from this data poll, um, but a total of 274 usable data points um, that we were able to use for data analysis. And for the cadavers, the range of age was from 50 to 103 years old. So when we started preparing our cadavers, we first measured the length of clavicles bilaterally. We divided that by half to give us the location of our midclavicular line. When we multiplied the length of the clavicle by 0.75, that gave us the location of the anterior axillary line. The reason why we chose to multiply the length by 0.75 rather than use the pectoralis major was because not all cadavers had the pectoralis major muscle. And so that allowed us to have a more consistent um, area for uh, reference. The posterior axillary line was measured or marked based on the location of the latissimus dorsi muscle. And we finally measured the uh, distance between the anterior axillary line and posterior axillary line, divided that by two to give us the location of our mid axillary line. So after we marked the location of the anterior axillary line, the posterior axillary line and mid axillary line um, from the first to the 10th rib, we cut two to three inches posterior from the posterior axillary line with an oscillating bone saw. Um, we learned the hard way that if we cut a little bit cl too close to that posterior axillary line and remove the rib cage, we would end up breaking some of the ribs because the cadavers were fragile. 
And finally, we remove the diaphragm from the xiphoid process and inferior rib cage using a scalpel and blunt in, uh, dissection tools. So as we dissected um, out the intercostal neurovascular bundle, we made sure to remove the innermost intercostal muscle fibers and clean the fascia overlying um, the structures in the intercostal uh, neurovascular bundle without um, disturbing its uh, path. So we used red pins to um, locate the intercostal space within at the anterior axillary line and mid axillary line. We mark the location of the vein using blue nail polish, the artery using pink nail polish, and the nerve using green pins at each intercostal space. Finally, we wrote down the order of the structures, and then we took a picture of the structures with a ruler visible. And so after we had a picture, we used ImageJ software to measure the distance of the intercostal spaces and the structure within um, the intercostal space. So you can see in this image off to the right, the nerve is denoted with the green pins. The red pins show you uh, this intercostal space. The blue nail polish that might be faint to see on this um, picture is where you have your vein. It might be even more clear down here. And then the artery was denoted by pink nail polish. And we chose to use nail polish instead of pins for those structures because they were a lot tinier than expected. And so that allowed us to have a clearer picture and view when measuring at the end. So finally, our data analysis. We found a total of 35 variations in the intercostal nerve of the intercostal neurovascular bundle. And we noted the order of that intercostal neurovascular bundle from the posterior aspect of the anterior rib cage. So starting here moving to the anterior aspect of the rib cage. And so you can see van held true as the most common uh, variation. We had 48 data points support that. And then below that, for example, we denoted um, when structures were running um, superior to inferior using the slashes. So nerve overlying vein and artery. We used the 2005 study for reference when we were measuring the location of the intercostal neurovascular bundle. So if the structures ran within the um, costal group, we gave them a negative value in terms of measurement. But if they ran below that costal group within the intercostal space, they had a positive value. And so I wanna draw your attention to data points eight, nine, and 10. This um, shows us the average distance um, of the vein, artery, and nerve within the intercostal neurovascular bundle. And each of those values has a positive denotation, which means that they ran within the intercostal space and not within the costal groove. So after completing this project, we did have a diverse data pool to pull from, so that was one of our strengths, and we were able to pull using a, uh, using a method from a published paper. However, one of the couple of the weaknesses within our research project was delicate structures, lost data points due to structures being damaged. Our data pool did consist of the elderly, so our question was, does this anatomy change with age? Um, and if so, how can we study this? And of course, as always, using more data points to have a greater um, data pool to pull from. And so our research project was informative as a preliminary study, but if continued, we would have to address these strengths and weaknesses to build a better project moving forward. And so the impact of this research project was finding that VAN was the most common um, variation of the intercostal neurovascular bundle. And although that is the most common variation of the intercostal neurovascular bundle, because we found 35 different other variations, we should be teaching medical students that the intercostal neurovascular bundle can run much lower than the costal groove of the rib, and sometimes even in the lower 50% of that intercostal space. We're gonna recommend that 
pushing for physicians to use ultrasounds to determine the location of the relevant anatomy before placing chest tubes if the situation allows for a non-emergent placement of a chest tube. But as always, moving forward, live patient validation of these results is warranted. So seeing how the anatomy holds up in a, li a living patient versus a cadaver. And so some future studies that we are looking um, into maybe would be utilizing the safe zone that we calculate with this project to insert chest tubes via the Seldinger method to see if structures are damaged. And we would of course try to do this in cadavers. The second one would be determining if ultrasound can be used to visualize structures consistently and decrease the complication rate in a clinical setting. And so this um, idea of using ultrasound and guided research was uh, based off of this study. They used a thoracic ultrasound to look at the variable location of the intercostal artery. And they found, yes, it did also run a lot lower than that superior rib. There's also been studies that utilize CT segmentation. And so they were able to segment um, thoracic CTs to look at the course and variation of the intercostal artery. So moving forward, um, we're putting together our manuscript and hopefully um, looking to submit to any of these three journals um, because they're free um, and peer reviewed. So that's my research project. Um, this project wouldn't have been possible without the help of all these individuals. And I'm very grateful for all of their contributions this year. Um, Dr. Stewart, um, Dr. Z, um, Casey Anatomy Fellows, our Joplin Anatomy Fellows down here as well. Um, Bonnie Turner, our li medical librarian, our gift body program at KCU. And then um, my PI, Dr. Withnell. And so those are my references and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, student Dr. Dash. That was a great presentation. Um, as she just said, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand in Zoom or type it in the chat if you can't um, say anything. Um, Dr. Johnson, I think I saw your hand up yes, first. Yes, ma'am. So Neat, thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, are you, I wanted to make sure relevant to uh, um, your, your study, um, are you suggesting that the usage of ultrasound needs to be implemented prior to insertion of the chest tube? If it's non-emergent, yes, because it can help identify if that intercostal neurovascular bundle is running below that costal groove. And so when they insert the chest tube, they won't end up hitting the artery vein or nerve because if they hit the nerve, they'll end up with sometimes with chronic neuralgia. If they hit the artery and vein, it can cause um, hemorrhage. If serious enough, it can cause death even. Understood. Uh, do you have any, and I say this in respect to you, do you have the data that shows that pertinent to the ultrasound data that, uh, or excuse me, the frequency of traumatic thoracotomies or chest tube insertions and versus the less frequent use when uh, implementing a, a Doppler ultrasound. Do you have that data? We don't have that data yet because they haven't, um, they haven't really implemented that in a clinical practice. Because yes. I think most of these studies are being conducted in the emergency room when they're trying to do sure. um, these Understood. procedures very quickly. Understood. Understood. Um, the other thing is, is that when you did encounter uh, abnormalities, uh, did you know or do you know that the indication for the chest tube was um, associated with a higher frequency of those abnormalities? Meaning, was it a bloody effusion? Was it uh, a empyema, uh, a big pus pocket, or was it just a big plural effusion. Do you know any correlation between the pathology or why the tube was put in other than a pneumothorax? Why the pathology, what, what it was, and the degree of injury? Can you correlate that? Um, 
if I understood your uh, question correctly, the cadavers we used didn't have chest tubes inserted prior before. These were um, just cadavers uh, that we opened up and looked at the anatomy. Understood. Understood. Okay, that's that's fair enough. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well done, by the way. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Wolf? Yeah, thanks. I enjoyed your talk a lot. I'm going to ask, ask a question based on my own stupidity. Um, and that is when they're inserting a chest tube, how much of that is done with cutting and how much is forcing? Because in my old surgery days, I tried to keep a scalpel away from anything that might uh, uh, get easily cut. And I tried to use blunt force to insert through muscle or something like that to, um, you know, like kind of a, 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 I couldn't figure out or what the, what the chest tubes look like, but where, where things were sharp and where they were dull and, you know, to what extent you could kind of find a little spot, make a little hole and then expand it without actually doing cutting? Um, so based on the literature um, that I've read, they'll first make an incision with a scalpel at the location that they're wanting to insert the chest tube in. And then they'll use, um, um, they'll insert the chest tube using um, pickups, or not pickups, I'm so sorry. Um, well, they'll insert the chest tube in and that'll be more of a blunt dissection that they'll use to clear out the area, clear out that fascia, and then insert that chest tube in. I think it comes, the structures being severed doesn't really come from the scalpel as much unless they cut too deep, but it comes from them um, bluntly pushing in that tube if they end up just using too much force. You, you can use uh, a hemostat to grab the tube and push the tube in through that way, then release your hemostat and advance the tube, or you can use a trocar uh, to help uh, introduce the, the tube. Yeah, thanks. That's what I was going to say. Because I, if if I were to do it, I'd cut the skin, and then I'd be sitting there with a blunt hemostat or whatever, trying to dissect down to the point where I could could think that I saw some striated muscle that I was going to try to force my way through or whatever. Yeah, but you're right, Dennis. Uh, yeah, an incision needs to be made some way. Depth is uh, depth is the, the is other. the big yeah the big yeah, deal the, yeah right. Awesome. Um, it looks like you also have a question in the chat from uh, Miranda. She asks, did you find a difference between the five through seven intercostal spaces? Um, uh, one of them, I can go back. I'll actually go back to show this. And so the intercostal spaces, the distance, uh, the distances are numbered five through six through seven. And so you can see that the largest intercostal space was that sixth intercostal space. Um, but typically you would expect the fourth intercostal space to be the largest. So whether that was a change within um, the cadavers being older or whatnot, um, but that would require us to do more, I, I believe use more, a more diverse data pool because our cadaver age was a lot older. Awesome. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much again, Student Dr. Dash, and thank you everybody who joined us today on this Friday afternoon. Um, we have five more presentations for our weekly journal club before it comes to a close for the semester. Um, then we'll see you again in the fall. Um, next week's presentation is by Student Dr. Kara Fadinelli. She will be doing she is also an anatomy fellow at Kansas City University and will be talking about her research um, concerning popliteal artery aneurysms. So thank you again, everybody who is here. I hope to see you again next week. And thank you so much again, student Dr. Dash.